Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel Zero to Siva. We are in day four. I hope you completed uh, day one, day two, and day three videos. We are in day four. In this video, I'm going to explain about actually what is a problem with point to point integration. Actually, what is this point to point integration? What are the problems? What is an ESB? And how ESB helps in solving P2P integration? What is the idea behind ESB and how it works? Okay, so let us get started. Assume that I have a third party web service, a SOAP web service. So if there is SOAP web service, there will be a WSDL file, right? Which is nothing but a contract which contains information about what all operations are being exposed, what is the input message, what is the output message, etc. Okay. Suppose if I have to write an application to consume this SOAP web service, what I would do? Suppose that I am writing a Java application. What I will do is, there are tools which will generate Java code from WSDL, WSDL to Java. So using that tools, I will generate Java code and I use that Java code to consume this SOAP web service. That means my Java application is integrating with a third party SOAP web service. Actually, we can do integration in many ways, but whether we are following best practices or not, we have to look at. So I will always look at how my application is coupled with other application. So basically there are two types of coupling, loose coupling and logical coupling. So let us see if there is loose coupling between my application and this SOAP web service. Mm, assume that the SOAP web service is developed using Java today. And I have written my application to consume the SOAP web service. Okay. But later, the service provider decided that they want to implement the same web service using .NET. Same web service. That means the contract is same. So they have re-implemented the SOAP web service using .NET. Now, do you think my code has to change? As long as contract is same, no, right? Because contract is same. As for the contract, normally whenever we are consuming SOAP web service, what we do? We create a SOAP envelope in our code and send the SOAP envelope as HTTP body. We'll make a HTTP POST request and in the body, we'll send this SOAP message, SOAP envelope. So as the contract is same, this SOAP envelope also is same. So my code need not change. So that means by default, if you are consuming a SOAP over HTTP protocol, there is already loose coupling. Good. Let us see logical coupling. Okay, first of all, what do I mean by logical coupling? Logical coupling means service provider need not know who is the consumer or the client and the client need not know who is the service provider but still they talk to each other if i have done an integration in such a way then i can say that my client and the service provider are logically coupled okay let us see this case um, i have generated java code using wisdom and in my code i am creating soap envelope right that means my code knows that it is consuming a SOAP web service. Client in this case is knowing what type of service is it. Is it a SOAP web service or a REST web service or something else. So in this case, in this integration, the client or the consumer knows who is a third party service provider. Yes, it is a SOAP web service. Where is it located? Yes, my code also needs to know the endpoint URL. My code has to make a HTTP request to this endpoint URL, right? So my code also needs to know the endpoint URL. Okay, the client needs to know about the service provider. So that means that there is no logic. 
electrical coupling, right? Oh, so if I am consuming a soap web service using a traditional way, there is no logical coupling. Here in this case, I am doing point to point integration. That means my application is directly talking to the SOAP web service. So if I am actually doing point to point integration, this is one of the problem. We cannot achieve logical coupling. Then what is the idea? How can I achieve logical coupling? Let us see. Again, the same web service. This is the Okay, this is the SOAP web service and this is my application. Now, in my code, I will not create a SOAP message. Hey, normally every message will contain uh, headers and body or payload, right? Even a SOAP message or SOAP envelope contains headers and payload. Um, every message, whether it is a JMS message or HTTP message or anything will contain headers and payload. So now the idea is in my code, instead of me generating a SOAP envelope, SOAP message, I will create a generic message, not specific to any protocol, a generic message. Again, my message also will contain headers and payload. Then, instead of me sending that message over HTTP, what I will do is in my code, in my application, I'll configure a in memory queue and put this message over this in memory queue. Then, again in my application, I will configure an adapter, a component like an adapter, in this case, a SOAP adapter. What is SOAP adapter? will do is it will take the message whatever I have kept here in this queue. This message is not a SOAP message. It is a generic proprietary message. Okay. In my own format, it also contains headers and payload. So I'm keeping my own message in my own format in this uh, queue. The SOAP adapter, it will take this message, convert my generic message to a SOAP message and then it will invoke the SOAP web service. So in this case, I am just configuring the SOAP adapter and also configuring the in-memory queue. And in my code, I am not creating a SOAP message. I am creating a generic message. So do you think my client needs to know whether it is consuming a SOAP web service? No. Whatever I am consuming soap or rest, it doesn't matter. So tomorrow, if my service provider says, hey, we are stopping the service, soap service, and we are exposing same set of functionalities using rest. Do you think my code needs to change? No, only in the configuration, instead of soap adapter, maybe I will use a rest adapter. That means in my code, my code need not know whether it is talking to a SOAP web service or a REST web service. And my code even does not know what is the endpoint URL. Everything is in the configuration of this adapter. So I can say that my code is logically coupled with other things. Right? This is how we can achieve logical coupling. What is the advantage? Tomorrow, if the service changes like from SOAP to REST, my code need not change. That is the advantage of achieving logical coupling. Okay, let me uh, tell you one more requirement. Assume that this is my application. Whenever my application is getting a request, my code is getting executed. Now, before my application makes a request to this SOAP web service, it wants to validate if the incoming data is valid or not. If the incoming data is valid, then only it may want to consume the SOAP web service. So what I can do is in my code, I can create a message with as usual, like header and payload, keep the message in the in-memory queue. Now, 
Now in this, I'll configure a component called as a filter. I might need a component like a filter, which will take the message, whatever is in this queue and check whether the message is satisfying some criteria or not. Is the message valid or not? If the message is valid, the filter will keep that message on another in-memory queue. If the message is actually uh, not a valid message, the filter can throw an error or an exception. If everything is fine, the filter will keep the message, same message in another in-memory queue. And here I can configure my adapter to consume the SOAP web service or whatever. So sometimes I might need a filter. Okay. Let me add one more thing. Assume that whenever I'm getting a request, I'm getting the data in JSON format. But the other party requires the data in XML format. So before I'm sent, before I send the data to the other third party, I might need to convert the data from JSON to XML. I might need to transform it. So sometimes I need a component like a transformer which can transform the data from one format to another format and this transformer will keep the transformed message into the next queue. Then maybe here I will add an adapter which will consume the SOAP web service. Okay. So we understood that sometimes we need a filter, sometimes we need a transformer and we will be using various adapters like SOAP adapter or REST adapter etc. Now let me tell you one more requirement. I mm, will tell you with an example. Um, I go to a website called as smartpricks.com. This is a very good website. Uh, actually, I want to buy an iPhone. What I will do is I will search for iPhone on this website. So what it is doing is it's showing me the results iPhone. Okay, suppose if I want to purchase iPhone 14, I'll click on this. Now it is actually showing iPhone from various uh, e-commerce websites like from Flipkart 65,999 from Chroma. This is a price. So actually this smart Prix is giving me prices from various e-commerce websites. Okay, assume that I'm going to develop a web application like Smartprix. So what I would do, let us see. So I'm going to develop a web application. This is my web application. Assume that my web application needs to get the prices from various e-commerce websites like Amazon, Flipkart, Roma, whatever, X, whatever. So what I could do is whenever my web application gets a request, such request, in my web application, I could write the code to integrate with Amazon, Flipkart or Chroma. But if I am directly writing the code to do integration in my web application, again, I am doing a point to point integration with all this e-commerce platforms and I end up writing huge code, right? That means the developer has to write a lot of code to do this integration. Actually, Mr. Mass Rosen, the founder of Mule, what he says is a developer has to do a donkey work writing all this extra code. Why should a developer do all the donkey work? Let us take this donkey work out of this integration. So there he says, okay, use my product mule, which can take all the donkey work out of integration. So actually you will not write integration logic in a web application. You will write uh, integration logic separately using something like mule. I'll come to that. So now, as I told you, in my web application, I will not write the integration logic. I will write uh, integration logic in a separate 
application. Now, whenever a request comes to this web application, the web application needs to get prizes for iPhone from all this e-commerce websites, right? So this web application can invoke another application where I write my integration logic. So here my code gets executed. My code will take a request and put the data in a queue. Whatever data it gets, it will create a message which contains headers and payload and put it in a queue. Then maybe I will use a filter. After filter, maybe again, as I told you, I might use a transformer. Then, now, assume that I might want to conditionally get the data from only Amazon and Flipkart. Assume that over the website, the client prefers to get price only from trusted websites like Amazon and Flipkart and it doesn't want Chroma. So conditionally, maybe my application needs to actually give request to either Flipkart or Amazon or both. So what I might need is after transformation, this transformer will keep a um, message on this in-memory queue. Then I might need something like a router. Router will be configured with multiple queues. Based on some condition, the router will keep the message in any one of this in-memory queues. Then here we'll add adapters. This adapter will consume from Amazon. This adapter will consume from Flipkart. This will consume from Chroma. So maybe sometimes we need a router which can route the message to various other providers and get the response back and then give it back. So sometimes I might need some component like a router. Hey, this is all in the configuration. We need some library or a framework which provides me with ready-made filters, transformers, routers, and wide variety of adapters like SOAP, REST adapter, database adapter, file adapter, Salesforce adapter, SAP adapter. We need a library or a framework which provides all these components so such frameworks are called as bus frameworks why the name bus normally in a bus what we do we travel from one location to another location and back here also don't you think that my message is traveling from one location to another location and coming back right so my message is traveling through all this set of in-memory queues or actually we use the word channel in-memory queues are also called as channels so my message is traveling over all these in-memory channels filters transformers routers adapters etc and coming back so i can say that by using all these components i created a bus like infrastructure through which my message can travel to and fro so any such framework which allows me to create a bus like configuration, we call that as a bus framework. And what is an ESB then? Enterprise Service Bus. What is the difference between a normal bus and an enterprise service bus? Okay. Let me tell you within your organization, within an enterprise, you might be developing lot of applications so don't you think for all the applications security is a common requirement yes transaction management thread management pool management these are all common requirements for any enterprise application so do you want to write the code for security transaction remoting pooling etc in every application no we want declarative security. We want declarative transactions, declarative pooling. Just by declaring, we want all that. I don't want to write code. So these services, security, transactions, remoting, pooling, these all are called as enterprise services. Any bus framework 
which provides these enterprise services declaratively we can call it as a enterprise service bus so mule is also a enterprise service bus initially when mule started mule was actually started as an esp but right now mule is much 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 more it has much much more capabilities but initially mule started as an esb mule is nothing but one of the esb available in the market so now you understood what is a bus what is an enterprise service bus and what is mule you understood that through your web application you don't want to integrate with the other services directly by using point to point you do it through something like an enterprise service bus what is the advantage you can achieve logical coupling tomorrow if you want to actually uh, integrate with some other service also that is done only through configurations here no need of code right that is the advantage so normally what we do is we write integration logic in mule applications so that is a uh, just a brief introduction about what is a bus what is an enterprise service bus and what is mule in my next lecture i'll continue from the same point we'll discuss about again what all mulesoft provides what is orchestration what all mulesoft provides and what is this any point platform provided by mule see you next lecture